We had a conversation in the backyard where we were talking about healthcare in general. You were welcoming at the time. Yeah. That was just when the pandemic started. Yeah. And we were talking about how challenging it is to find jobs. No, it started off because you had a way cooler job than me, and I was jealous. Because you were working at Harvest, the venture studio, doing the startup company, like, consulting building thing, which I thought was pretty neat. And then we were talking about, like, is there anything in healthcare? And then you're like, well, let's come up with something, let's brainstorm something. That's where it really started. The whole healthcare industry is going to change dramatically in the next couple of years. To chronic disease management and the preventative aspect of care. AI can now understand the key clinical concepts of what's being verbalized in healthcare. Welcome to Cherry Live. I'm Dr. Jordan Valraff, physician, entrepreneur, and chief medical officer for Cherry Health. We're talking about Canadian healthcare. Join us as we speak to innovators, industry leaders, and people working to drive the health system forward. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And then, and then you were um, working for Tells at the time. Yeah. Since you're being responsible for the Alberta telehealth delivery. And then we put our heads together, putting together a spreadsheet. Oh, yeah, then, um, yeah. We, came, we brainstormed some ideas, and then you came back like the next week with the most outrageous looking spreadsheet I'd ever seen. It had like eight tabs on it and like a whole bunch of math happening and you change one variable you're like look we'll be billionaires <laughs> the <laughs> graph went up <laughs> I think the main the main motivation behind was you know realizing that just healthcare is so fragmented and I mean you were clearly having an issue finding the right opportunity um, while also like you know being involved in the community um, and that you're not the only one you know this is like an issue throughout experiences for physicians are not necessarily I guess what people coming out of school or med school expect, and so yeah, finding the right place to work is a real challenge. And that's that's how we got started. Right? Well, it was the combo of two things. There was like the jobs problem, which I was experiencing, but then while I was working at Telus, they used Slack, like that was their business yeah, communication yeah, yeah, yeah. tool, and it blew my mind because I'd never seen anything like this in healthcare. Like, it was just like a, a group community chat forum for all the people that are working on the same thing and then it was just super helpful all the doctors would be talking to each other asking each other questions how do we set this up how do we do that what do we do with this patient um and it was just like why did we not just have this in general and so that was where the original idea for building the medical network came out of we're like okay well we'll start with the jobs thing and it'll look like linkedin but the goal is to have that connection, the community actually like bring together the healthcare practitioners. Yeah, exactly. Building the sort of healthcare connected and then building tools on top of the network that provide true value. So it's not just a fad in terms of like connecting people to look at cat pictures, but rather like disseminating valuable information to that. Exactly, exactly. Like a pragmatic business tool. Not like the Facebook for doctors where you're just like it's kind of superficial and recreational, but more of like just a actual, this thing solves business operations challenges and is useful on the day to day. Yeah. How do you think we're doing so far? And I thought it takes a lot longer to do things than initially you imagine, like just like how long it takes to like build the actual platform, like just coding and creating things, and then there's the actual like testing. Like you remember the early phase of the pro- the, the whole network was just like so buggy. <laughs> yeah, we just really test it. It was crazy. So like I think we had the idea in May 2020, and two months later we went live. We actually went live with the first app. So I think we were like super fast and like trying to test it, um, and like. Obviously, you were having like user user um, interviews, and, like really making sure that we're sort of hitting the nail on the head with that initial delivery of the network, but then also the job function. Essentially, initially, we really focused on just locums, and then we very quickly spun out to other jobs as well. Um, yeah, and we realized that after going live, after like one month, like you know, it, my background is more mostly in business development, but also some of the biotechnology and coding was sort of secondary. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for some reason, the entire database of the app was duplicated onto our users' phones, which is not only insecure, but just not scalable. So we had to rebuild the entire thing and uh, release a new version, I think, like a month after. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. That was fun. So yeah, it took, it took a lot longer to like actually build the stuff, and it takes a lot longer to get people to use the things. Like We figured, okay, there's a doctor shortage. 
and we're doing this whole thing, it's free, it doesn't cost anything, like we're giving away water in the desert, to like people will be flocking to it en masse, but it definitely took a lot longer to like actually get the awareness and the visibility within the medical community. Like it's just like a very closed, locked down, yeah. conservative sector. And so that definitely was also quite challenging, didn't expect that up front. And then, like, anything external, anything you're waiting on for, like, a third party to do, obviously they've got their own priorities and things going on, whatever other, like, side project kind of thing coming from another company or another organization like us is, like, often low priority. So it takes a lot of time to actually, like, any of these external partnerships or dealings or, like, sales operations with the clients. Like, like everything just takes a lot longer than it. I initially thought yeah, I think it was. especially in healthcare because you're right like it's super regulated yeah. but then on the other hand like I think there are also a lot of champions early on like we talked to the PCNs who started to promote us here in Alberta uh, the Canadian Medical Association gave us the innovation grant within like a few months of us releasing which was incredible and actually got us kickstarted yep. to yep. allow us to kind of do full time work and then really pursue Cherry Health to where it is now which is really incredible well yeah you took the plunge quit your job yeah yeah that was a big step like in the winter of 2021, went like full time. What were you thinking when that happened? Were you like, oh good God? I was like, let's go. Let's go. Let's build <laughs> something conference. massive. Let's build something really cool and solve like real problems. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so at the time, what were you working on at Har- um, was that at Harvest or what was the other one called? What were you yeah, I was involved in like two venture studios at the time. Um, one more focused on agriculture and the other one more on fintech. Yeah. Um, but my background prior to that was always in healthcare. So I yeah. used to work for Bayer Pharmaceuticals, also in the venture investment side. And then prior to that, um, worked um, at, in academia and did my PhD, also mostly focusing on building products for patients and um, healthcare professionals. And so, you know, like sort of that, that lack of adoption in healthcare was always very pervasive. Um, and the challenges with that as well. And I think like one of the interesting things that we're also doing with Cherry is, you know, like we're connecting healthcare, but healthcare is, you know, when you think of the physician and the healthcare practitioner as as sort of the main delivery provider, which is totally true. But then you have sort of the subset of demographics that help, right? Like you have the, 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 the MOAs, the assistants that help to run your clinic effectively. You have the nurses and everyone else that essentially help the physicians. And then you have, um, product and therapeutic providers that also play a fundamental part in the delivery of care. And that always struck me as really interesting, is there's no really easy way to connect with physicians effectively. And I think that that is in part also one of the allures of, of Cherry Health, that we're building some of this digital distribution channel, you know, between healthcare practitioners, but also for industry to access healthcare practitioners in a meaningful way, not just in, a, in an exploitatory, you know, appetizing way. Exactly, that gateway for things to actually get disseminated, because that's the biggest problem right now, right? Like, we use Facebook for everything. Jobs, patient care, logistics, like, vetting companies and vendors, service providers. And so it's just very helter-skelter, like, it's all over the place. You don't really have any, like, organization or superstructure to it. You don't know where these pockets of doctor groups are unless you stumble across it by accident, or you're, like, really searching specifically hoping something exists or somebody else invites you to it and you're like oh cool and so it's again very fragmented just like with many other things in the digital health space yeah i actually made some notes of that actually in terms of like trends within canadian healthcare and like i think like one really interesting piece that i thought was you know technology adoption within healthcare like what what do you think like around you know how it's currently going where it should be going within that because i mean there's always it's a double-edged sword, I feel like. It's slower than we would like, for sure. I mean, you can see right now, like, the entire system is just plagued with slowness and inefficiency. The, the CMA, the Canadian Medical Association, they've got their big $10 million grant call-out for proposals right now for reducing the admin burden. So it's, like, the number one, I don't know if it's the number one, but it's, like, the top couple things just, like, impacting the system right now. There's just not enough tech and adoption and tools to make and speed up, automate the mundane and the redundant and all these things. So everything is still like one-to-one manually done. You know, it's like you're 100% sure that it's getting done correctly and the human is looking at every single step, but 
anytime a lab gets ordered, an image gets ordered, I mean, there's like five different places that this internet fax gets processed through and categorized and tagged and assigned to people and all the different, like, everything you do with a patient has to get documented and charted, like, just for your own, like, legal protection, just so there's a good record if somebody else takes over care. So, like, the more charting, the more actual, like, note-taking you do, the better. But, of course, that takes a lot of time. So that's where these, like, AI ambient scribes look really promising. Like, you just completely focus on patient care. You don't have to, like, yeah. write anything. Now there's tools coming out that actually, like, layer on to the EMR to actually do function. So before we would have macros. That was like the best thing we'd have if you were using an EMR. You'd type like... Like an Excel macro, basically. Exactly. You'd, you'd type like slash back pain and then it would like pre-pull up like some copy-pasted text and then you'd fill it in. Mm, but now cool. they have like actual function macros layering onto your EMR so you would tell it like write a prescription for this and it would like pull up the prescription writer and like fill in the drug and the dose and the common thing you still assign it off and, and okay it but it saves you a bunch of clicks the typing and very so interesting they're starting to be this extra layer of tech added on to the tech now and so there's just like no shortage of things to, to speed up and improve so access to care one of the biggest problems we have right now and so making all the healthcare providers yeah. more efficient that's the, that's the goal. Today's episode was sponsored by Fomaderm. Fomaderm is an advanced compounding base for topical drug delivery, proudly developed by researchers right here in Alberta. Unleash the power of topical diclofenac with Fomaderm's nanotechnology to improve skin delivery, ensuring precision and efficiency. The non-greasy water-based foam formulation is preferred by patients and lets you use significantly lower concentrations of diclofenac to reduce skin irritation and side effects. Elevate your patient care with Fomaderm. Visit www.rstherapeutics.com today to receive some free samples. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think like, it's really interesting. I spoke to um, one of the sponsors that we had on a recent Cherry networking event, a physician networking event. And I think he was talking about his company that was doing very similar things. So like trying to uh, support the MOA with AI um, to the point where they could become much more effective and also alleviate um, you know, a lot of the sort of administrative burdens for the physician. And then um, I think, I don't know who it was, it was must have been Dr. You must know whether the name comes probably back up. She was saying that um, we've been disappointed so many times with technology. They've, they've overpromised so much and never really delivered in the past sort of decade when sort of tech really took off in health tech. But I think there is sort of a, a natural suspicion with everything that comes out nowadays. But it feels like with AI and sort of generative AI, there's sort of this shift change in terms of capability. Uh, partly out of necessity, because you have to. Like, yeah. just, like the system is so strained right now that you have no choice but to like optimistically hope that all these things coming out are the, the secret tool to unlocking that productivity, but also because it's just so much more mainstream. Like Chat GPT 3.5 hit the market a couple months ago and it just blew up everywhere. Like now AI is a household name. Like your grandpa knows what AI is and might even have it on his phone. And so it's just, I don't know, there was a lot of that like suspicion in medicine just forever, anyways. You know, yeah. Show me the evidence. What's the data say? Uh, you know, when it comes to like patient care and treatments, like, okay, what's like the actual number needed to treat? How many patients am I going to harm by using this versus how many am I going to help? And that same level of suspicion has like transitioned over to the tech and the tools. Everybody's just skeptical of everything. Like, okay, what's the, what's the actual downside? What's going on behind the scenes? And so it's just been like very, very much more slow and conservative. There's like more privacy. There's more security laws and yeah. protocols needing to be followed. Anytime you adopt, and like here in Alberta, at least legally with the Health Information Act, anytime you adopt a new technology, you are supposed to like submit a new privacy impact assessment, which is a whole giant monstrous process of documents and policies and have that approved on. So anytime you do anything other than like update existing software or add a new user to your existing software, you are supposed to jump through all these hoops, which obviously keeps people's data more secure, but it does really you know, kind of pose a barrier to actually improving things, trying new things, right? And then just that barrier to entry. If you want to switch 
electronic health records. Like, let's say you're like not 100% happy with this one and you want to try out a new one. It's not just like you download a different antivirus program, pay your 20 bucks, and then eight minutes later the whole thing is fully set up and done. It takes months and months and months and thousands of dollars to like migrate your patient data from one system to another. Everything's got to get ported over. Every field, every individual piece of data gets mapped over to the appropriate spot in the new software. You're reconciling manually all the discrepancies in the areas. And obviously you got to like pay the electronic health record vendors to do all this. So it's not like it's easily switchable for some of these apps. And the, the EMR is like the main software tool that physicians have in their clinics. Like that's pretty much like the thing. Like you might, I don't even know what else you have. Like, like everything revolves around. Yeah, that's like your your companies. operating system almost yeah. for healthcare is your EHR, and so just that huge switching cost really slows down things because all the new innovation and everything is getting layered into those EMRs or like the crosstalk connectivity between EMRs or not or not. Yeah, yeah. And so there's like that big barrier to entry to upgrading your core tech. Yeah, I think the EMR business is such an interesting area to be in and we've had the pleasure of talking to or you had the pleasure to talk to multiple new EMRs like companies that you know starting up in BC and in Alberta and kind of like trying to solve that incumbent that you were describing which is like companies have been around for decades didn't really have a need to innovate because once you're in a clinic it is very challenging for the actual physicians and health providers to switch and um, you know the initial setup is expensive but once you're in the clinic it's, it's you're probably there for life. It's and, sticky. Uh, yeah, it's a very sticky product. Um, but I think there's some really excited, exciting changes happening, and EMR providers are seeing the the benefit of interoperability and, and, and trying to move into that space. Um, but it's also you know very much a shift from the existing business model. It is. It is. And so hopefully that process just gets more and more smooth. People get more accustomed to upgrading their tech trying new things but i mean like people are still using the the software and the technology until it gets sunset by the manufacturer there there are people out there still just using paper charts they're like tell that i'm not gonna bother like this is too much it's changing all the time yeah it's yeah. crazy actually yeah. that's still the case and i think they're over we had a recent um sort of market scan i think they're over 700 emrs in canada what yeah i mean some of them must be really small in terms of market share or extremely specialized, yeah. super proprietary. Um, and then you obviously have some of your larger players, but like, there's a lot. Yeah. 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 And I think that doesn't stop, right? Like you start with EMRs, you go through administrative solutions as well. Um, then you go into hospitals and you have like more sophisticated softwares that do very specific things. So I think sort of the burden of having to vet which technology best fits my um, workflow um, is only going to become bigger you just need like a way to compare and it, it's easily see what's out there this show is brought to you by cherry health canada's medical network where healthcare practitioners connect physicians pharmacists nurses chiropractors and all other healthcare professionals can sign up for free start connecting messaging with colleagues or checking out job opportunities posted by thousands of employers across canada with dozens of healthcare specific job filters and search options, we make it easy to advance your career, find your dream job, or line up your next locum with hundreds of new jobs posted every week. www.cherry.health to get connected today. It's tough. You, there should be like a speed dating for EMRs set up. You just like log on and go check them all out all at once. Something to keep in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Something to keep in mind. It's like a it's like topic because we talk a lot about. AI, I think something interesting, you know, I'd love to go a bit more into like actual care provision. What about telehealth? What about it? I find that like especially in Canada, like the like provinces take a very different stance on it. And like how how they value it in the in the in the overall um, pathway of providing care. Like in Ontario there have been massive shifts in the billing codes which actually render telehealth being less um, less useful to use or like from a from an operating a clinic perspective. And so a lot of physicians revert back to normal care or care within the clinic. Where you can see a lot of benefits but at the same time, you know, from a convenience factor for the patient, telehealth is great. 
So I know what, from a physician perspective, how 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 do you feel telehealth telehealth's role should evolve within the delivery of care, especially continuing care? I, I mean, I think telehealth is great. Like just customer experience is something largely overlooked in healthcare from the get go. Like. Doctors not getting paid by the patient. Doctors getting paid by the province. There isn't that direct like financial yeah. incentive to like have a good experience. The patient can go and poop on you and rate my MD, but nobody really cares. Everyone just writes it off as like that. Ah, it's just whiny patient. So like it's just like not something that's been paid a lot of attention to. I mean like. Does a patient need to come into your clinic, book half a day off of work, and sit there to get a refill on their prescription every three months or whatever it's been set up to, right? So there's just, like, a lot of, like, dogmatic kind of silliness that we've been practicing that way for decades upon decades, right? Versus could we not have just done a lot of this through the phone a long time ago? Probably. So I, I think, like, telehealth really has a lot of potential to bring that care out to some of these underserved, rural, remote, northern communities, places that just don't have access to physicians. So it really will equalize that access to care out quite a bit more distributed across the country. I mean, in Ontario, it is interesting because they kind of like chopped the legs off of those virtual care billing codes. So I think the intent of that was mostly to prevent like telehealth companies from taking over because you can still bill and it can be a lucrative venture like for a doctor who is seeing his own or her own patients virtually. So like I was just saying, you know, if they need a prescription refill, they don't have to actually come in and book a day off work to do so. So if you still have your own panel or roster, you can see those patients virtually as exactly. well. It's more like new coming ones and slowly seeing them virtually. Exactly. So like having a company start up a telehealth operation and then have a doctor meet a new patient digitally across the province, like that basically it doesn't work nobody's going to do that because it's just like very financially disincentivized you could do it and yeah. you're like pretty much volunteering your time at that point so not many people i think are going to do it but if you want to keep in touch with your existing patients in ontario it's definitely feasible here in alberta it's a little bit more loose um that it's a lot more open and you can see patients start new patient engagements from distance so the the rules here are definitely more conducive to that virtualization of care. Yeah. Or you then start ending up in the private private payer side or self pay side where if you want to provide that value then you know you'd ask the, the end consumer to pay personally, which is I think especially a public payer system, something that we're not used to. And um, yeah, it's met with a lot of um, I think challenge challenges, right? Well, the rules on that are different too, right? Like a doctor can't charge privately for something that they're also charging publicly for. I think you have to like fully opt out of the billing system if you want to do that. So like for example, there if you want to have like a private knee surgery or something like that, which is publicly available in Canada, surgeons will fly to a different province, work at a clinic for a couple of weeks, and then fly back to their home province, and then they're billing publicly on the public system for that one. So. I don't know how that would actually work if you were like a family doctor seeing patients virtually. Maybe if you were on like a salaried ARP contract from like a benefits company and part of the benefits package for employees is you have access to a telehealth provider. Maybe that's how you would get paid privately for stuff that you're also billing publicly. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. I've never done anything in that space, but you definitely, I think you can't be doing both at the same yeah. time. Very interesting. Do you do you feel like it's going to move in that direction, like more into like self pay or like private private I have no idea. I've heard that the Alberta government is trying to push things that way. Like, there's never been anything published, I don't think, by the Alberta government that makes that claim. But there's been a lot of actions by the Alberta government that people are interpreting as that's the direction they're trying to push things is towards a two tier system. So it very well could happen. Wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think this is where like technology really, really is a really interesting play as well. Like, technology in general is deflationary, right? Like trying to like improve an existing process um, and hopefully thereby increase efficiency. And so that could be a really interesting way. Like if you make a concerted effort in terms of adoption to keep the public payer system as like more effective and keep it around as long as possible. Because I mean, there's there's a lot to be said for public 
pay out healthcare systems that can provide care. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important. Well, the virtual side, you know, then it gets interesting because the, the doctors, there needs to be the financial incentive. So that's why there's been the big push here in Alberta lately for getting onto the team-based care model with complexity factored into the billing codes. Because otherwise the doctors argue that all the easy patients go to the virtual care. Mm -hmm. I need a refill. I have a runny nose. My, you name it, right? Like the simple things that are going to take five minutes versus half an hour to figure out. And if the billing code remains the same, regardless of what the underlying problem was, then the doctors who are doing the, the more complex patients, you know, like the older person with multiple com comorbidities, they're going to take a lot longer to sort things out. So then they're feeling disenfranchised and left behind because they're like, well, why wouldn't everybody just go to the, the, the easier side of things? This is the same argument's been, been made about walk-in clinics for yeah. decades, right? People are like, well, the easy patients just go to the walk-in and then I'm stuck here dealing with Grandma Smith's heart failure and COPD and kidneys falling apart and everything all at once. So then it's like, okay, well, you got to make sure the incentives align. Interesting. I mean, this is where the complex cases are. So like the real tough, tough conversations, longer, longer time that you spend with the patient probably as well. So yeah, it makes complete sense. Of a complexity factor, very yeah. interesting. We'll see. So there's a lot of potential there. I think there's like a lot of different ways the technology can help and the virtual care platforms can really bring that equitable access to care, but the government needs to respond by making the financial incentives proportional depending on the situation so there aren't some people left behind. What's it like in Germany? How does their system work? It's a two-tiered system. Yeah. So you've got the public, but then if you, um, you can switch to a private healthcare insurer if you have an income above a certain amount. Mm -hmm. The very interesting thing is that the if you switch to a private payer system when you're young to the private payer insurance, uh, you get great access or like faster access to care. Use utilizing the public. Um, hospitals and, and resources um, so you can simply access them faster and it comes at a cheaper cost than the public payment system. How does that work? Because as soon as you choose that you, um, you want to go private, you cannot go back and then they get you when you get older. So as you get older and your bills start increasing, mm -hmm. you start paying significant amounts yep. um, and like a multitude more like Usually, like a fact, a fact, like factor of one in terms of magnitude compared to the more linear increase that you see on the public side. I can see that. I remember hearing a statistic. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like you use ninety percent of your entire life's healthcare spend budget in the last. I can't remember if it was ten percent or five years of like your life or something. Like it was like massively disproportionate towards when you're. It age. makes complete yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, like the like. I mean, I feel like. When you look at like sort of the rapid decline of health, or, or like the, I think the goal is just to always like try and stay in that high quality of life health region as long as possible, and at some point it just starts dropping off. Right? So, what was the critique then of the hybrid private public system in Germany? Not everyone can like it, or do they? Is it widely acclaimed as being incredible? I think that initially it was like seen as a great solution to being able to provide great care for everyone, but if you wanted to access better care, you could. Um, by now, because it's it's not that they're just like fully private clinics, in the end when you have complex surgeries, you're still using the public system. Mm -hmm. um, you're running into very similar issues that you see here, which is, it's all stretched. Um, you have a physician shortage, you have a nursing shortage, general provider shortage. Um, and people are working overtime and, and not, not really compensated for it. Very similar issue to you. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Interesting pieces to that actually with the interprovincial license. Uh, and like there's a lot of conversations around like um, people moving around or like potentially being around, moving around. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a good idea. I think it'll help more than it'll harm. A lot of people are worried that, you know, soon as they leave. Yeah. yeah. The, well, I, I don't know, personally, I doubt that a few forms and a thousand dollars of registration fee are locking in the doctor to a community that he, he or she otherwise think is not a great place to live and they're just itching to get out of there. So I don't know, that argument to me sounds a little bit ridiculous. I mean, when you look at it at a population level, 
I'm sure that will happen once or twice, but I, I can't picture that being a common thing to occur. So, I mean, somewhere somebody is going to be like, look, I was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> they changed the licensing and then the doctor left because it was just easy. But I think on the whole, it'll just make it more portable. Again, easier for doctors to travel up north, go try somewhere things else. else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Try yeah. different things, go to the East Coast for a working vacation, go check things out for a month or two and work while you're there. So I, I think it would be a net positive overall. Yeah. It's a very interesting mindset, that, that, so that scarcity mindset around physician, physician resources and healthcare provider resources, which is completely understandable given that we are working in a, like our ah, physician shortage, generally speaking. Um, but so it's the ability to, I think, have that free flow of resources, like you said, can also be a net positive where you give people the opportunity to be there for a short period of time. And I think that's a lot of the feedback and a lot of the stigma that we've been working against with Cherry Up as well, right? Connecting healthcare is not always viewed as a positive because you're making it easier or like you're providing an insight into something that you may not want people to have a look inside in. And in the end, people want to work at great, great clinics where they have, you know, a good working environment and, and potentially a, an interesting patient demographic to work with. And transparency in that regard can be challenging sometimes. But I think it, it's a great incentive also to then, as a clinic and an employer, to raise the bar and see what's up there. Yep, exactly. So yeah, we've I mean, we heard the same feedback from a lot of people using our network of like, well, we don't want our doctors to see this platform. Like, okay, it'll help my clinic's jobs get more visibility with our locums and our temps, but then they'll see other jobs. And we're not very confident that our clinic is <laughs> going to retain them. And so it's just, again, looking at it from the individual person's perspective, follow the follow the incentives and they're they're worried that scarcity mindset just like you mentioned right it like really changes behavior you know okay something might be in the best interest of the system as a whole but if there's like a little bit of potential blowback on the individual they're not going to do it yeah yeah very interesting and i think i think what that actually shifts to and i think that is actually a net positive is is thinking about the like the rate limiting step within healthcare, the, the, the key limiting factor, which is the provider. And so trying to ease their life will make them appreciate the place that they work at more. And so the risk of them leaving goes down. And so I think that that is like a key indicator, right? Like if you can create a great working environment, make their life easier using administrative solutions, support staff such as MOAs to kind of help them practice as best as they can and really focus on their patients. That is a great indicator for, I think, a, you know, a, a good working environment. Yep, exactly. Make the doctors happy, or I guess it's applies to any employee, make them happy and they'll stick around. I mean, I've seen lots of places that do it well and lots of places that do it poorly. Like one clinic I would low come at, they had a different front end office team pretty much every time I'd get there and so you never really got that flow that rapport with the staff members I remember there was always one like really wonderful MOA who stuck it out somehow for a bizarrely long time compared to everybody else but yeah it just like it rips a clinic apart like I don't know what it was that they were doing but without that stability between the team members it's very difficult to like have a well run organization yeah, taking care of your staff and employees is the key. Like in the end, you know, business can only run with people. Like you can only do so much as a single person. Yeah. yeah. Our generation and the Gen Zs, I think they're a little bit more fickle when it comes to careers and jobs, though. Like versus our grandparents, they'd work at the same company for 40 years and retire on their pension. Versus now, I think the average is like definitely in the single, low single digits for how long a job lasts. Yeah, yeah, loyalty is like a challenging thing. I think like what, what in the end matters is like mission and uh, personal fulfillment. And if you can make those two things align, then, then people stay. Yeah, uh, yeah. What are your thoughts for 2024? Uh, what about it? Healthcare trends, what excites you currently in the, in the scene? I mean, a lot of stuff on the digital side I find very enticing. I think there's a lot of like really cool new tech companies coming out now that like the AI is just so pervasive everywhere uh, there's like a lot of innovation coming out there every time we go to a conference there's more and more of these different tech companies with 
like really cool, promising looking products. Even like seeing some of the older tech companies, or not necessarily old, but like the ones that we saw last year, uh, just how things have developed over the last 12 months is incredible. So I think there's like a lot of really, really innovative stuff coming out. And I think like now that the healthcare system is sort of getting to that breaking point and everything's falling apart publicly and it's, it's hard to like sweep it under the rug anymore. People are like, okay, we got to change, you know, that like slow moving conservative skeptical mindset is starting to shift so now you're starting to see those people that would have typically been the, the late adopters starting to move up the spectrum a bit so i think there will be a lot of good coming out of it i don't know in terms of like the primary care system there's just been a lot of doom and gloom about the whole systems crumbling and falling apart and it's hard to say like really where that rock bottom is yeah are we there are we there now or can it get an order of magnitude worse it's hard to say but I mean, there's a lot of unrest and people are starting to like be more open-minded. So I think that'll really influence how the next couple of years go. Yeah. Actually, speaking about Alberta specifically, you know, I think the age has just broken into four different sectors. Yeah. It's acute, continuous care, mental health, and what was the other one? Primary care. Yeah. So um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how, how that breakup actually hopefully has a positive effect. I think there's like a lot of people also thinking it's a crazy move. But we'll see, I mean, change also has a lot of possibility. I'm, I respect that they're trying things, right? They're like, okay, we have a problem, we gotta do something. Maybe you can't just continue to do the same things again and again and think things will get better. So, True. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Everyone's always skeptical anytime anything happens, but. I like to try and be optimistic and hope it'll help. I mean, their thinking was that it'll remove some layers of middle management and they'll be able to run a leaner operation by breaking the organization down into the four. So, Alberta Health Services split up. Maybe it will be leaner now. I mean, small organizations usually means you have more capability to like look into the various policies and what's going on. Like, it's very easy to get bloated when you're not seeing the forest for the trees. So that might yeah. actually, you know, work in their favor. Then again, I don't know, that was part of like what they touted as the benefits previously was Alberta Health Services was the largest health system across the entire country. And so they're like, well, we can be quicker. You know, there's less red tape. We can just make decisions more swiftly because there's one central decision signing authority. And they certainly have done a lot of like innovative things over the years, like NetCare was pretty ahead of its time. So that was like the provincial system where all your labs, your blood tests, your images, your consultant reports for a patient would show up. Sort of that one patient, one record philosophy. And everywhere else didn't really have that. That was like pretty, pretty revolutionary for Alberta to have this, pro this platform. You know, you go somewhere else and you get discharged and then you get readmitted to the hospital later that day at a different location and the ambulance drove somewhere else and they're like what just happened we have no record of any of this and so that was pretty cool uh, connect care so now this provincial wide electronic health record system for the hospitals which plugs in with all the emrs in the clinic um one person i've talked to so far is liking it <laughs> growing pains so they're still very much in that like initial adoption period and yeah. a lot of people are, are frustrated and burdened by a lot of the inefficiencies and things there but perhaps it will be you know again the head of its time and revolutionary by the time it's all settled in right now the vibe on the street is not particularly positive other than the one doctor uh, but I don't know, we'll see. I don't know, again, yeah, it's, it's a power move, right? You know, that's one of the things that's nice about having that central health system with Very true. is that they can do things like that, so. Very true, I mean, like it goes, goes along the way of like interoperability and connecting healthcare, like in the end, like that, I think that is the play. And then the question is like, more on the execution and operational side of like, is it set up in a way where it truly accelerates healthcare? And like you said, Medcare clearly did. You know, a very positive thing there, so we'll see. Yeah. Verdict, verdict is still out. <laughs> Maybe this whole this challenge weighed into why they decided to split back up and separate the acute from the primary care. <laughs> so it's, we'll see. Some thoughts on your end. What do you think? 
<laughs> I've never used it. I'm like, <laughs> I've never actually logged on or seen it, so it's hard for me to comment there. Fair enough. Well, Sounds we'll like to, a great idea. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk to some people like maybe next later next year and see how the integration has gone. Yeah. Nice. All right. I think, um, yeah, I think this is an interesting sort of wrap, like from a Jay perspective, you know, I think interesting moves this year, like around in terms of like really solidifying sort of our um, ability to connect people and like hopefully still help from a from a connectivity and, and job opportunity perspective. You know, looking to support nurses as well. So we'll see where that takes us. But um, yeah, what are you the most excited about for twenty twenty four coming up at Cherry? I think you know, like the initial vision was to connect healthcare. We started off with jobs and job opportunities uh, and we try to sort of address the physician burnout and uh, res resource and shortage problem. And then the vision was always to go further, um, to not just stick it out in that area, but actually provide value in other areas as well, um, to in the end empower physicians and healthcare providers. And we have some interesting areas that we want to focus on in the new year. Uh, that go beyond job and job opportunities and really help sort of more around the administrative side um, and the actual delivery of care. And so I think there's a lot of exciting things that we can talk more about in the coming quarter um, and that I think our users will actually start experiencing as well. I think it'll be nice having the, all the allied health professionals on there. I think that really ties things together quite nicely, like in terms of all the outpatient clinics that are multidisciplinary, in terms of all the hospital teams that are run in multiple facets. Like we've talked to a lot of different professions already, and the same problem exists everywhere in terms of their jobs, in terms of their locums. It just is like not often a very central platform or system for coordinating. Again, Facebook winds up being the, the logistics backbone for a lot of what they need to collaborate on. So it'd be really nice having them on there. Yeah, yeah it'd be really interesting to see that and then also how they could potentially be used, um, not just from a you know con core connecting perspective, but also from a referral standpoint, especially with allied health, um, mm -hmm. which is very much underserved at the moment. I think patients are very much left alone in finding the right provider um, and by giving essentially sort of primary care the ability to actually look about who's actually around, who's got time, um, you know, beyond specialists but actually within the healthcare sector is, is really something that we want to work on and hopefully that also being um, you know, an efficiency gain within the entire system. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, the team-based care model, right, there's just not enough doctors to go around let's distribute the work right if everyone's working at the top of their scope as efficiently as possible that will definitely help with the access to care it's just going to be a matter of creating those collaborations and those lines of communication I think starting off with referrals you know how do we actually find each other who's capable of doing what and just like getting that information more freely out there I think that'll make a big difference yeah or the wait times right like sometimes I mean I think like right now we very much rely on our personal network and the people that we've referred to in the past because our patient had a great experience, which makes complete sense, but doesn't necessarily look at the you know, availability and, and wait lists and of how quickly a patient could potentially receive care. Um, and so I think that's a very interesting opportunity um, that we'll be looking at actually pretty soon. Exactly, exactly. Collecting the, the hive mind to start putting some of this data together, the wait times, the experience, was it positive? Was it negative? Was it subspecialized enough, right? Because doing it independently by trial and error for all these different practitioners in your area, you can imagine like the, the cycle of sending out a patient versus getting information back, right? Like how was that psychologist? Did they, you know, versus look at any other digital marketplace right now, there's always a system for accountability on there, the insights, the data, right? Uber's got ratings, Amazon's got ratings, right? And then you look at the healthcare space. Again, it's very much closed off. You don't have these insights as to anything. And so by making that more visible, more transparent, it'll just be much, much easier for you know, practitioners to navigate. You know, who should I be sending this patient to? Not just for referrals, but for things that the patient can seek out themselves, helping to direct them and put things in the hands of the patients. Yeah, yeah 100%. In the end, like, efficiency gain, but also hopefully like, you know, empowering the physician to see what, you know, what's out there um, and, and raising the bar of, of care in general.
Yeah. 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 I think lots of exciting things. I think we can close out. Be really proud. Like, you know, where we've come to, we're super thankful for all the users that have started adopting Cherry Health and using it on a regular basis. And we yeah, can't wait to <laughs> launch into the new year. Yeah. All right. Thank you for having me on the holiday special. It was a pleasure. Mm-hmm.